See if that's on now. There you go. Uh, we seem to the Southern Baptist Convention this afternoon. He left after here. Um, I told Kim her job was to keep him busy and not to uh, let him think. Because when he drives and, and goes, he thinks, and he thinks up stuff for us to do. So <clears throat> Mark sent me a text about an hour into their trip, and it was a picture of Kim asleep in the seat next to him. So that wasn't good, but anyway, she was actually playing. She was tricking me, uh, but anyway, they are still, they're almost there. There was an hour, they were stuck in traffic an hour on the interstate, so they're almost there, and he was trying to get there for a prayer meeting they were going to have at 6, this see, it'd be 6.30 our time, 5.30 their time, so hopefully he's going to make it. So that's where he's at. He'll be there this week. Uh, Charles, don't know if you're aware, but you're doing the Bible study Wednesday night, he told me to make sure that you were aware of that. He said he said that to you. I'm sorry? No. You know the realignment, you know, that whole thing, you know? <laughs> so uh, you got Wednesday or we could trade right now. I sent him a message and I said, hey, the, I, you know, he asked about the temperature that was in here this morning. And he said, he thought it was because he was bringing the heat preaching. And I said, no, Mark. I said, we have seven air conditioning units in this room. Five of them aren't working. I said, that's what the problem is. He said, oh, okay. And I said, uh, so tonight it's 81 degrees in the sanctuary, so I'm going to call off services, and I'm going to put a sign up that if you want a sermon, call Pastor Gary, and I will do it tailored to the individual. I can't tell you what his reply was, but it wasn't good. So Kim said to please pray for her. Her trip is getting worse and worse by every text I send. So anyway, all right, there's a couple of things. Hope you saw the announcements in your room this morning. Fall Women's tree Retreat is coming up. You need to be signing up for that. <clears throat> Women's Summer Bible Study. Uh, going to start at the end of this month, June the 29th, and then we're having, and I had I didn't have a thing to do with this, we're having a watermelon and ice cream supper. Okay? Fellowship, okay? So I guess some of them are going to sit on one side of the room, yard eating watermelon and the other half on, not everybody can eat ice cream. They don't have to come. <laughs> I'm just kidding, you dairy-free people, I know, okay. Y'all can have watermelon, that's what the purpose was. Okay, see we're trying to be in, inviting to everyone. They are, I'm not, all right. <laughs> you just bring ice cream, I mean, and watermelon. Okay, and then there's a Discover NPBC a class coming up at the end of the month as well. All right, anything else, Deb? I don't know if it's hot back there, but it's hot up here. <clears throat> All right, Mitch, get them singing. Maybe you might, I'm not sure you want them to stand up, though. I'm just well, saying. See, there's more circulation if you're standing up. More circulation up. when they stand yeah, up? So, okay. Yeah, yeah, I could stand up. And we, oh, I had a request for some old school stuff, okay. church hymnal kind of stuff, so we're going to go there tonight. Yeah, we had a little, uh, did y'all did y'all catch the little bass uh, little, yeah, did you hear that? Thank you, Mr. Bob, we appreciate that. So right now I need to know who my altos are. I got no altos in the house. I know I've I got a couple back there. I know I got somebody that, that'll cover for me. So we're gonna do uh, y'all. Most of most of y'all do you grew up on the church hymnal at least uh, are familiar with it. Okay, all right. I invite you if you like if you want to stay seated and sweltering and all that you can or you can stand up and, and kind of get a little circulation going. Either way is good. Just stand and sing with us tonight. <clears throat> As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me, leads me safe.
safely through the sinking sand. It is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Altos, here you go. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need thee every hour. Through this land, this pilgrim land, be by thy saving power. Hear my plea, my feeble plea. Oh, Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Blessed Jesus. some of you out there. All right, sounded good. You know, it's kind of hard to do multiple parts at the same time, so y'all just kind of jump in there and sing something. It'll be okay. All right. Second verse, same as the first. Here we go. Let, what? It, that, there's, really? Where are the words? And he spoiled. Everything's automated for the most part, and now he's having to click. Uh, I know it. It will. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Austin. I didn't mean to bring them down on you. Ladies, ladies. ladies. Oh, my word. Oh, y'all have encouraged me, but let's sing. Let me travel in the light divine that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy, thine and sing redemption song someday. I will be a soldier, brave and true, and ever firmly take a stand. As I onward go and daily meet the foe, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. I guess I need thee every hour through this pilgrim land. One more. When I wander through the valley, dim and worth the setting of the sun, lead me safely to a land of rest if I a crown of life have won. I have put my faith in thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need thee every hour. Through this land, this pilgrim land, protect me by thy saving power. Hear my plea, my feeble plea. Oh, Lord, Lord, a God on me. When I need What is that? Y'all hear the call to walk? I don't know that. Y'all know that verse? 
Skip, skip that verse. Shall <laughs> so walk with me. I'm going to try that in a minute. What Mitch tried there, when I get to a verse I don't like, I'm just going to say, skip that one. Let's do it. <laughs> See how that works out for me. I can pretty much tell you how it will, but anyway. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's near the front of the New Testament. If you're looking... 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to answer some questions about heaven tonight. I hadn't preached on heaven in a while and thought I'd do that. I, I was pulled out my uh, tabernacle sermons. I, I love to preach on the tabernacle and the items that are inside the tabernacle. And I've done a couple of those <clears throat> recently and was going to get inside the veil tonight. And I said, I, I changed my mind about Wednesday. And the Lord changed my mind and said, Let's just preach on heaven. And I, I decided I'd do that. <clears throat> Uh, get some heaven questions because I, I want you to have some understanding about heaven. I don't want you to be like the, the stories told <clears throat> the stories told that you get to heaven. Uh, it, what happened was the story, I'm going to tell it this way, uh, uh, Deb uh, passed away and she got to heaven, got to the gates and when she got there they looked at the book said, yep, your name's written in the book. Just one preliminary question. You need to spell one word to get inside the gate. She said, oh, no. So what's the word? And uh, he said, it's love. 
She said, I can spell that L-O-V-E. And he said, that's it, come on in. By the way, you'll get a call one day soon and you'll have to come do this at the gate as you, as you're part of your chores. And she said, okay. So it wasn't long and she was called to the gate and she got up there and they said, you know what to do? Yes, we know what to do. And it wasn't long she was sitting there and Bob shows up at the gate. And Bob said, well, what are you doing? She said, this is my job for the day. And he said, okay. He said, well, no worries. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But one preliminary thing, I have to ask you to spell one word. And he said, okay. I don't have any problem with that. She said, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> That's what she'd do to you, isn't it, Bob? Yes, I know. I, I've got the same. But anyway, <clears throat> that's not how heaven actually works, Okay. So that's not how it works. So I'm going to try to share with you some things that will answer some things about heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in the first four verses. <clears throat> Let me, I'm reading from the King James. It says, It is not expedient for me to doubtless for to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such and one called up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, to start out with there, a couple of things you need to understand about heaven. Number one, it says there that there's a third heaven in the second verse. If you caught that, say amen. All right? So if there's three heavens, what does that mean to you? Now, this is what we tell the Bible drillers, okay? If somebody says there's a first John, then you automatically know there's a what? A second one, that's right. So if there's a third heaven, you know there's two others. So does that mean to us that there's three heavens? And if there is three heavens, then which one am I going to go to? And how do I know which one I'm going to go to? Now, look here. It, it, let's just start here and, and discuss the location question. The location question comes into play here by saying, first of all, number one, there's three heavens. There, there's three heavens. Recorded in Scripture, there are three heavens. Now, where are they? As we look at them today, the first heaven is what we see. You can see one heaven when you look up into the sky. Yesterday, I think it was, we were coming home and uh, we'd been out at Cindy's mother's house and, and uh, working out there and we were coming back and got off on 321. And man, there was just an absolute gorgeous rainbow. I mean, I don't know if you got to see it, but it was just huge and very vibrant, brilliant, vibrant colors. And, and that's the first heaven that you see. It goes out about five or six miles, and you can see that visually with your eyes. The second one is past that point, and that's the part that you see the stars and the other planets and all those things, and that goes for millions of miles. Now, <clears throat> the next thing I want you to realize is that that third heaven is up. Now, I've had people come to, and debate with me or try to debate with me and say that heaven can't be up everywhere. Well, it can be. If Scripture says heaven is up, guess where it is? It's up. I mean, it's not a debate. <laughs> if the Scripture says it's up, it's up. Well, what if I live in Antarctica? Well, number one, you don't. You live in Lenore City, so it's up from here. And if you did live in Antarctica, guess where it'd be? It'd be up. Because that first heaven, you see the second heaven is past that, and the third heaven is going to be at, up there somewhere. I don't know where it's going to be. I don't know how you're going to get there. I'll share a little bit more about that as we go through, but let me, let me just tell you that it's up there. Someone said that you see the first heaven by day, you see the second heaven by night, and you see the third heaven by faith. You see the first heaven by day, you see the second heaven by night, and the third heaven by faith. There is that first heaven, that atmospheric heaven, that place. And then you look at Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7, says, 
for promotion. Now listen to this, <clears throat> Psalm 75, 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Guess what he left out? The north. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Isaiah 14, 13 says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That was in Isaiah 14, 13. So it's very obvious that heaven is up from wherever you are. Not only is it up, but it's close by. Now, I just said <clears throat> there's probably five or six miles that you see the first heaven. Then that next heaven is millions of miles. How can it be close? Well, according to Scripture, it says that it was close enough for Jacob to place his ladder and climb to heaven. Now, anybody else got a seven million mile long ladder? Anybody want to try to climb a seven million mile long ladder? I don't even climb the four-step ones anymore myself. So, you know, it's a close-by location. Not only is it close-by, but Scripture says, Elisha said, Lord, it's close enough that he could call out to the Lord and say, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And when he did, he opened his eyes and there were chariots and horses of fire gathered all around him. Heaven is so close that the angel could come down on resurrection morning and roll the stone away. Heaven is so close that an old saint of God like the disciple of John on the Isle of Patmos was called up instantly. So don't get caught up as some people do if once you figure out that heaven's a long way away, it's really close by. Not only is it close by, we understand that it is a place where Apostle Paul said in, first, in Philippians 1.23, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. He, he says here that the location of heaven is where Jesus is. See, sometimes we get so caught up on where it is and all about it that we forget the purpose of heaven is where Jesus is and that's where we're going to stay. That, that's our location. That's our final destination. This is not it. You know, one of my responsibilities here at the church is with the facilities and the maintenance and all building and grounds and all that stuff. So the air conditioner ain't more, it's my fault. It went out last night. I got the call about nine o'clock. I called my air conditioning guy and said, can you come over? Nope, <laughs> which I knew was the answer. I expected the answer, but he couldn't come this afternoon as well. But that's one of my responsibilities. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Hey, it's one of my responsibilities. I'm, I'm responsible for that, but I'm not going to worry about it. I didn't worry about it. Not worried about it tonight other than I feel it up here, but <laughs> it's not a concern. It's not a big worry of mine because this is not my home. This is just temporary for me. I, I, as the scripture says, I'm just a pilgrim passing through on my way to my final destination. The thing that we need got to keep in mind about heaven is it's the place where Jesus is. John 14, 3 says, And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, what, there you may be also. It's a location question. Where is heaven? I don't know the exact location of heaven. Couldn't tell you. Other than it's up. I can tell you it's close by. I can tell you it's far away. But I can tell you one thing that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I know that Jesus is there. And I can tell you something else with confidence. I'm going there too. Now, I can't tell it about you, but I can tell it about me. So that's the location question. The second one that I like to spend more time on is the description question. If you turn over into Revelation chapter 21, Revelation tells a lot of things that are coming and coming to be. And then you get to Revelation chapter 21 and it says, verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. First thing about the description of heaven is it, it's a renewed or a, I use the word renovated city. It says it's a new heaven and a new earth. Will those two things be suspended and will be caught and transferred between? I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't know. I, I, I truly believe with all of my heart that when I get to heaven, I'm not going to worry about any of that stuff. I'm going to be more concerned about seeing Jesus. I used to say that I was going to go, when I get to heaven, man, I'm going to look up John and Paul and, and all those guys and say, how was it? What was it like being following Jesus? I don't think I will. I think I'm just going to go to Jesus. I, I think that's our, our emphasis in reference to heaven. And it's not so much of whether it's going to suspend in one place or another, whether it'll come up or whether it'll come down, whether it's going to actually be renovated, whether it's actually going to be renewed or not. I don't know the answer to that. I can just tell you what Scripture says. And it looks to me like, according to this passage of Scripture, it says it's going to be a new one. For the old one will be passed away. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from... Look at that. He said he's coming down from heaven, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. See, the description is it, it's renovated. It's renewed. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, it, it discusses the possibility of the, or, or the reality of the new creation. It talks about the facts of dissolving the old man and making them new. And, and I believe that's what's going to happen to heaven. How when in that final destination, I don't know what it's going to be like. I mean, I can give you descriptions of heaven, but how's it going to... Listen, God created everything. Don't you think he can create heaven to where it'll be the best thing that you ever had? I remember when the kids came up to me one time and said, Hey, Pastor Gary... Is there going to be animals in heaven? Well, you know, God made animals. The scripture records that when he comes back, he's going to be coming back on what? And we're going to come back with him on what? On horses. You think God's going to just let horses into heaven and nothing else? I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I know that in this case, this child was referencing her cat and wanting to know if her cat was going to be in heaven. And I told her, I, according to what I can read from Scripture, it looks like it will be. It won't be on my block, but it'll be in heaven. <laughs> you know, because heaven's a perfect place. And in my book, in my block, there won't be no perfect. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> it's a renovated place. It's a, it's a renewed place. And it, not only is it renewed and renovated, it, it's a royal place. The Bible describes it as the new Jerusalem. It's called in the Bible the city of our God. It's called the heavenly Jerusalem. It's called the holy city, the great city. It's called the bride prepared for her husband. Heaven is going to be a new Jerusalem. John said, I saw it coming down. I, I don't know how it's going to be, but I know it's going to be. Now, if you go on down in Revelation chapter 21, I'll try Mitch's version. We'll skip through a bunch of these verses since we can't remember those and go down to verse 16. Is that kind of how that worked, Mitch? I'd never seen that verse either, but anyway. Um, verse 16, I mean, verse 16 of Revelation chapter 21 says, And the city lie four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with a reed and 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are all equal. It, it's a cube, okay? It, it's a cube that stretches 1,500 miles every direction. Now, <clears throat> I had to do some research on this, but I, but I finally found what I was looking for, and listen to this. That amount of, of ground, let's say, if it's divided into floors, that amount of ground would equal 15 times more surface than the entire surface of the earth. That means it's, it, it's equal to 15 times the size of the earth. 
So I got to thinking, if it's that big, I get to heaven, um, you know, what's my place going to be? And am I going to have like a condominium or an apartment or what is it going to be like? So I did some more research and this guy said this. They estimate that there have been as many as 70, 70 billion people who have lived since Adam and Eve. If that be true, if we use the number 70 billion, did you know that you could fit the entire population on the first floor of heaven. That means it's going to be huge. Now see, I thought I was going to be in a house. And uh, uh, I don't know about your place, but my place is going to have AstroTurf, so I don't have to mow anymore. <laughs> so we're going to have AstroTurf out there, so no more mowing. Well, I live on just, a, I don't have a big lot, uh, it's about almost an acre, I think. And uh, <clears throat> it's the, far, the front part of it's on a bank. And my wife just hates it when I mow that bank. It's not a big deal to me. If you would, here's what I say. Honey, if you'll just stay out of the way, I can mow that bank. But she'll get down there and she'll think that she can mow it with the weed eater better than I can mow it with the lawnmower and by far much safer, and it's way more safer. It's way more safe if you stand on the bank like this with the weed eater going down like this. Well, it's not, you know. So I just mow that thing, I throw that thing in high gear and just go around that bank, and it kind of slides around. If, you, if there's nobody in the way, I got no problems. I can get it mowed. Just stay out of the way. But when I get to heaven, I'm not going to ride that lawnmower. When Cindy's dad passed away, one of the things that they gave to me was his lawnmower. I think that was a curse. <laughs> yeah, have you ever had one of those lawnmowers that it didn't matter what you do to it, it won't start? You, you can spend $400 on it, go out there the next day, go to mow a little bit, and it won't run. And you've got to work on it, tinker on it, and I'm not a mechanic, so I don't know how to do all that stuff. So it's just a pain and aggravation to me, and so... That's why I say I'm not going to have any grass on my property. Now, I, I realize somebody pointed out to me one time many years ago, said, Gary, if God makes everything new, he's going to make your lawn more new. And I'm good with that. If, he can, if he'll do that for me, I'm okay with that. Because I don't mind mowing. Because when I'm mowing, I don't answer that phone. I don't even hear it. So when you call or one of the kids, my family texts or that kind of stuff, I don't listen because I'm mowing. Got one thing on my mind and I'm out there doing that one thing. So I don't know what your place is going to look like in heaven. I don't know. I, I know it's going to be perfect. So when I come in, let's say, let, let's use our, our, our sanctified, as Mark calls it, our sanctified imagination. When I come in from mowing, when I come in, there's going to be right there on the counter a Coca-Cola with ice in it. Crushed ice, not just ice, it's going to be crushed ice. And if I mow a lot, it's going to be shaved ice. It's not even going to be crushed. It's going to be real good. And then I'm going to sit down, and when I sit down, in about 15 minutes after I've recuperated, there's going to be chicken and dumplings, green beans and corn, and red velvet cake. Now, that's my perfect place. And then I'm going to get up, and when I get up, the dishes are going to just disappear. Praise the Lord. And they're just going to disappear, and I'm going to go in and sit down on the couch or my recliner, whichever he has set for me, and I'm going to watch whatever he's got set on TV. You say, well, that's not perfect for me. Then that's okay. Don't come to my house. <laughs> it's going to be perfect for every individual one. It's a remarkable place. The size of it is overwhelming. The structure on the outside, you can look at it, it becomes sparkling, transparent diamond. On the inside, you'll find the foundations made of precious stones. You'll find the walls of jasper, the gates of pearl, the streets of gold, the trees of life, and the rivers. God has put together and planned for us a wonderful structure called heaven. The Bible says that the builder and the designer is God himself. Revelation chapter 21, verse 19. 
And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Which he testified, these things say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. What what does all that say to us? If we get a hold of the things that are in heaven, we're going to just testify of heaven. That's it. Not long ago, got a message on our uh, our Facebook, and uh, a lady said she was needing some help. And uh, her help that she needed was in reference to her child was needing to know about being saved. Well, it was a Wednesday. We were up here packing the boxes. I, Mark told me that it just popped up. For some reason, it popped up on his instead of mine. And I contacted her, and she said, could I just bring the kids by this afternoon as soon as I take, get them out of school? I said, absolutely. So <clears throat> being the good pastor that I am to children, I had to leave right then and go prepare. <laughs> And so I went down to my office, got ready, and, and sure enough, 3.30, they come rolling in, her, the mother, the daughter, and, and, and a son. They come in, sit down, and I started talking to the little girl about, about being saved. Yes. Come to find out, Marley Lanham had already talked to her about it, been talking to her about getting saved. I said, well, did, did Marley tell you about Adam and Eve? When, yep, that's when sin started. Okay, well, what is a sin? Well, Marley says it's this. When you do something that doesn't make God happy. Winner, you know. So, okay, so what do we have to do to be saved? Well, she said, you have to read some scripture in the Bible. And she said, then you have to pray. I said, okay, well, you know, I don't really know why you need me, but, you know, here I am anyway. So, okay, uh, are you ready? And I asked her the rest of the questions, and she said, yeah. I said, is there anything to prevent you from doing that right now? She said, no. Mom was crying. And I looked over at the brother and I said, hey, you've been sitting here the whole time. You're in seventh grade. I said, "Uh, have you ever been saved? He said, no. I said, is there anything preventing you from doing what your sister's doing? He said, absolutely not. I'd I'd like to do it as well. I said, well, okay, I usually only do one at a time. (laughs) But we'll do them both at the same time. So now I've got me in the room, mom in the room, the brother and the sister, they're both fixing to pray. I look at mom and I said, do you want to lead the prayer? Do you want me to lead the prayer? She said, no, you go ahead and lead it. Well, by now, me and mom both are crying, okay? So we're crying, we pray, and she accepts Jesus. And I said, listen, do you care if I contact Marley's mom and let her know what happened? And the mother said, absolutely, please do. And so I did, contacted her and and, uh, told her what all had transpired. And hey, listen, I'm telling you all that to tell you this. If Marley Lanham, little, the youngest of the Lanham girls, can lead people to the Lord to get to heaven, you know what I'm going to say next, right? Why can't you? You you know why we don't. You know why we can't. It's because we don't make it a priority. And I, I don't mean that to sound rude or arrogant or, or, or to be condescending, but, but, but that's, that's the bottom line. It, it's not a priority to us. Listen, if heaven's going to be that huge, why don't we want to bring in as many people as possible? Well, there's the structure, there's the size. What's the sites sight, of heaven? Hey, listen, there's all kinds of colors, there's all kinds of gems, there's all kinds of precious uh, stones that are going to be there. <clears throat> That's all found in Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> Excuse me, Revelation chapter 21. And uh, then there's some sounds of heaven. Now, I don't have time to print or, or to give you all the verses, but Revelation 21 verse 4, 27, Revelation 22 verse 3 and 5 will tell you more about the sounds of heaven and the splendor of heaven. But let me tell you a little synopsis of heaven what the scripture says about it. Did you realize the, <clears throat> the, the scripture tells more about what's not going to be in heaven than it does about what's going to be in heaven? 
It tells more of what's not going to be there than it does what's going to be in there. For example, no more tears, no more sorrow, crying, pain, lies, sin, night, death. And you could say, amen. There's more things listed in God's word that are not going to be in heaven than there are going to be in heaven. The reason is God doesn't want us to focus on heaven he wants us to focus on Jesus. So, <clears throat> you see the location. I'll give you a little brief location. I'll give you a little brief description. Now let me give you the main thing, and that's the preparation. The Bible says <clears throat> that we have a citizenship. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. And it says, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. R.G. Lee used to be a, a great pastor, a great preacher, great orator speaker. And in his last days, Dr. Adrian Rogers, <coughs> he, he preached at Bellevue, and um, then Adrian Rogers took his place. And in R.G. Lee's last days, Dr. Adrian Rogers was there. And Adrian Rogers wrote <clears throat> that when R.G. Lee was passing, he was there. Dr. Rogers was there. And he said, R.G. Lee opened up his eyes, raised his hands up, and said, I've preached on heaven for years and never gave it justice. Now that was somebody stepping into that final place. You say, can people actually see heaven? I don't know. The, the word of God, it teaches in reference to his word, says that if we do, then we utter not a word. Why is that? Because if, if heaven is all that we think and, and go to understand that it is, why would we see it and not want to stay? Why would we want to come back? 99.8% of the people that write a book about their heaven experience and come back to earth, when you read the, that book and compare it to the scripture, it doesn't match. It just doesn't match. We need to understand that the place of heaven is that place that is prepared for those of us that have made preparation to get ready. Now, have you ever made preparation for something and it not work out? Let me give you a little example. The Pinkston, we call them the Pinkston clan here. You know, there's like 47 of them. <laughs> Poor Daniel's on vacation for about three weeks with all them women. He's a way better man than I am. <clears throat> hey, the day before they were supposed to leave... They got notice that the car, vehicle, they were going to leave from here, drive to Chicago, get on an Amtrak train, and I think the train went to Washington State, maybe? Arizona, Arizona. okay. <clears throat> and so they were going to spend a night or two on the train. So they had to get a rental car to get from here to Chicago. Now, okay, six women, one guy for three weeks, do you think they each took an overnight bag? <laughs> so this vehicle couldn't be a, you know, a four-door sedan. They got a call that they didn't have any vans. And so Daniel was scrambling around trying to find a way to get these, this crew and all their luggage up to Chicago. And so he sent me a message. I sent him a message back. I said, Daniel, this is not a concern. He said, we may have to cancel he said, but I'm not real concerned. He said, it's a little disheartening, but I'm not concerned. I said, Daniel, it's not a problem. I said, take the church van. You'll fit in our church van. He said, I can take your church van up there. I said, yeah, I'll be glad to send Mark and Charles up there to get it. <laughs> be done away with them for two days. Holy moly, what a great vacation we'd have, Andy. But anyway... You know, you can make all the plans, and Daniel's been planning this for a long time, and you get down to the last day, and the plans just fall apart. 
when you make plans to get to heaven, they're done. The scripture says that that is sealed until the day of redemption. That, that your place is reserved, made ready, and God is working on it when you start. How cool is that? I mean, God's been working on my place for a long time. I can't wait to see it. I don't know what it's going to be like. But I know it's going to be just perfect. One, one thing in sport-wise, I don't, I don't, please don't hold this against me. I just don't like baseball. I used to play softball all the time. Played for many years. Played when I was much, much younger in Knoxville with the Pittsburgh Paint Company. And I remember I was the youngest guy on our team. And we played a, a group one night down at John Tarleton Field. And, and uh, they were called the Harley Davidson Club. And we walked out there and I was the pitcher. <clears throat> and, and, and this guy walked out there and, and they fit the part, okay? I mean, they come out there in their cut off sleeves, you know, and leather jackets to play softball. And they walked out there, and the guy just pointed his bat at me, and he said, hey, boy, he said, you're going to spend the rest of the night on the ground. I said, okay. I don't care. As long as I win, I don't care. And I'm telling you, I would pitch that ball, and they'd hit it, and it'd go about three feet off the ground right over the pitcher's mound. They weren't kidding. I spent the day, the rest of the night, on the ground. I'd pitch it and just go dive on the ground. Didn't matter if I pitched it up in the stands. I didn't care where it went. I was on the ground. <laughs> I was going to save myself. But, but I have got into, because Tennessee's at this place in, in, their, in their walk, that they're making it to the mid-regionals and all and fixing them. I'm, I'm into it now. Watched it last night till late. They won. Today, I didn't get to watch it because I was studying, but I checked the score before I got up to before it started here at 6 o'clock and, and they were winning on top of the ninth. I was excited for them. I don't even know none of them people. And I'm excited for them. You say, what, what has that got to do with heaven? Hey, heaven, if it's to you, it's a, if, if it's a perfect place, listen, you got to make preparation. Those guys didn't just start playing baseball yesterday. They've been practicing. They've been preparing. We have to do the same thing for heaven. Our preparation is very simple, but after that point, then we make ready for our entrance to see Jesus. Now, I used to say, and I, I'm, I'm honest, I used to say, as a young preacher, I used to say that when I get to heaven, I just want to make it in the gate. I just want to get in the gate and see Jesus. As I get older and learn more about the scripture, I don't want to just get in the gate, man. I want to get in there and I want to present him something. I want to say, hey, Lord, I was doing this. I didn't just take your talent and bury it in the yard, man. I, I took it and tried my best to multiply it. I tried to do everything that I could. I want you to understand that I'm doing the best that I can with what has been given to me. That's where we're at. If you're, let me say it like this. If your ticket's been punched, and you're on your way to heaven and you know that for sure, then as preacher Mark said, it's time to get to work. It's time to get to work. It's time to be inviting people to come. There was three, three new families here this morning that were visiting with us. Three new families that were visiting with us this morning that I'd never been here before. Did you talk to them? Did you get their name? Did you get their phone number? I mean, even if you aren't feeling comfortable contacting them, get their name and, and number or some kind of information and give it to me. I'll call them. I don't have a problem doing that. I'll send them an email. I'll send them a message. I'll do anything. I want them to come back. Everybody says this about our church. It, it is the friendliest place ever. It's the friendliest place ever. Three couples came in this morning <coughs> If we're the friendliest place, let's go get them. Well, no, now I'm preaching. That's a little bit out there now. I want to go to heaven. Yeah, there's no question about that. That's for sure. I want to go to heaven. I'm willing to ask Jesus to come live in my heart. I'm asking him to forgive me of my sins. I'm willing to do all that. But now you're asking me to do something else. I'm asking you to do what the scripture says is your responsibility. It's not even your job. It's your responsibility to go out there 
to share the gospel with others. I just just make that little effort, find out their name. I, listen, I'll admit I'm a Facebook stalker. I'll hunt you down. I will find you. If there's a way to find you, I can find you on the internet. Trust me, I can do it. Don't test me. <laughs> I'll do it. And I will find a way to contact you. People have come in here and they, you know, one thing we used to have problems with the church, they'd come into the church and they'd say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm willing to do this for the church. Okay. And that's what we'd say, okay. And we wouldn't get any information from them and then we'd never be able to contact them so we never could get them to do something. Well, when I find out their name, I'm hunting them down. I am going to contact them. I contacted one the last couple of weeks and she said, who are you? I said, I'm Pastor Gary from New Providence Baptist Church. Oh, yeah, I know. New Providence, I don't believe I've met you. I know you haven't met me. As a matter of fact, I sit in the back back there. I've usually got a computer in front of my face, and I'm sitting on the very back row, and I tell them where I'm sitting at, and that's where I'm at. <clears throat> this is what my responsibility is at the church. And so I just want to invite you to come back, and, and, and I would like to tell you about the things in our church. And, and they volunteered to work in the nursery. So you know what I did then? I said, well, to volunteer in a nursery, I need to do a background check on you. So now I need your name. <laughs> I need your phone number. Oh, I tell you what, I don't need that. You can just call, you can just go online and do it direct. I don't need that information. She's already done that, got the background check, everything's done. I said, contact her back. I said, hey, now, let me tell you what we're going to do next. I'm going to have Brian Kelch to contact you. You don't know Brian, but here's his picture. We've got to be active about getting these folks in and getting them involved in the church because if they don't get involved, guess what? They're going to just fall by the wayside. We've got to be prepared to get to doing something. You've got to have a birth. You've got to have a new nature. And you've got to have a new address. And let me tell you, the new address is heaven. Now, listen to me very carefully. I don't know where that heaven's going to be other than up. I don't know what's going to be in that heaven other than the, the precious stones, the colors that are described in Revelation chapter 21. But the thing that impresses me, excites me the most about heaven is Jesus is going to be there. I'm going to finally see him face to face. As the song goes, as the one who saved me by his grace. When he reaches out his hand and leads me <laughs> through the promised land. What a day. Ooh. What a day that will be. Are you ready? If not, make ready. You do that by asking Jesus to come live in your heart. You make ready by asking Jesus to come live in your heart. The scripture says that if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. It's a simple process. But we need to do it publicly so that the church will gather around us and support us and encourage us to go forward, to do more for the kingdom so that we can all do more for him, not for us. It's, listen, it's not about the church. It's not about the church. Now, I love this church. Don't get me wrong. I love the church, but it's more about him than it is the church. Are you ready to go? Hey, listen, 2021. This year, we made it through last year. Everybody's saying that. We made it through last year. We survived. We, we thrived last year. We didn't know it at the, at the time, but we were thriving. We survived. We thrived in 20. Here we are in 21, what are we going to do? Will you just pray and ask God to give you one person, one person to bring this year? One person. Just bring one person along beside you. Now, you don't have to bring them into the church. Maybe you can get a hold of one of these three couples. Darren brought one of the, invited one of the couples in and, and, and it worked out this week that I had to contact him and say, hey, Darren, <clears throat> things changed on Sunday. Hey, can you come and be here Sunday morning? I need you to teach a lesson. Uh, Lewis Rogers has had to go out of town, going to be out of town. Will you teach his lesson? He said, yeah. 
And um, then I asked him to run the camera for tonight. I mean, run the computer for tonight. And he said, okay. He said, I need to stop by and see you for just a minute. Well, he taught his lesson, came out of that class, came in here to see me at the computer. And while he was in here, the couple that he invited to come to church walked in the door. Yeah. How cool is that? See, if he hadn't been obedient to Christ... And, and taught the lesson and volunteered to do the computer, he would have missed them being here that morning, this morning. See how, God, how good God is to us? What will you do for him? Father, we come to you right now. I ask you to cleanse and forgive us. Grateful for all that you do. Lord, I, I really don't know what my place in heaven is going to look like. I used to say, Lord, that, that I wanted it to have orange walls and all that stuff. Lord, I don't even care about that anymore. I really don't. I really just want to see you. Lord, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, my mom and dad's there. And I want to see them, but I want to see you even more. I just want to be in your presence. I just want to be right there. I'm willing to do anything, whatever I can. What question do we have about heaven? My question is how soon can we get there? Lord, I'm, I'm grateful for the time that you allow us to have down here see my kids grow up and see my grandkids come along and get to enjoy the time with them, the fellowship with the rest of my family, Lord. That is all too sweet. But Lord, I can't wait to see you. Lord, help us to bring others along with us. It'll be that anxious to see you as well. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Yes. Mitch, just going to ask you to play. I'm going to ask you all just to bow your head for just a minute. I'm going to ask you to pray individually for whatever you need to do to be ready for heaven. Right now, just say that between you and the Lord, nobody else. Or here's what I think I need to do to get ready to be in heaven. And say, Lord, in the meantime, will you let me, will you let me try to bring somebody with me? Will you tell me who that is? Don't, don't pick somebody that you want. Let the Lord pick them. Now you still work on the one that you want, but let the Lord pick this one. <clears throat> I mean, if we're really going to work for Him, let's go to work for Him. And then the last thing I want you to ask the Lord is to put everything else out of your way push it, shove it, whatever needs to be done so that you'll do this. And I want you to know I'm praying for you every single week. Mark prays for you every single week. We got folks that are praying for you every single week. Our desire is for you to see Jesus. Are you ready? Father, we come to you tonight and ask you to cleanse and forgive us once again, Lord. I pray that if we're not ready, we'll get ready. Before we leave this place, whatever we need to do, we'll do it tonight. Lord, I, I pray <clears throat> that you... you you'll be the forefront of bringing somebody with us. You'll put that person in our path. 
in our mind, in our thoughts. Lord, so that we'll know that's the one we need to be focusing on. Lord, you know that I have others already I'm focusing on that, that I want to see, that I want to hear that they're made preparation to get to heaven. But Lord, more importantly, I want the ones that you want me to do. The ones that you want me to talk to. And Lord, Lord, put everything else out of my way. Meeting with the air conditioning man this week. Meeting with the repair people that have to come and do this and that around the, the facilities here. Don't let that stuff take to the forefront. More important than sharing you with others. Push it out of the way, Lord. Shove it. Whatever needs to be done. Lord, and I pray I'll do my very, very best to listen to you. And I'll do my very, very best to share you. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. God bless you. Hope you learned a little bit tonight. Hope you'll be encouraged about heaven in the days ahead. All right? God bless you. Have a good week. Anything we're supposed to announce? All right. And you're free to go.